All right. So the uh, um, uh, uh, basically what's going on here. So Mar Margaret's bringing some ideas into the room. I'm going to bring some ideas into the room. Um, in Indy will also, un unfortunately, his plane is delayed. He'll bring some ideas into the room next. Um, and, and then we'll hear from, uh, from Katerina Pastor, uh, which I'm very excited about. But I'd like to start by uh, with just the, uh, sort of a thesis, which is that uh, property orders society unjustly. I think this is, it's almost just something sensory. You can kind of see it if you look around carefully. And uh, that's what this picture kind of illustrates uh, nicely. Um, the, the, the next slide, so I would say, you know, for example, like when I was, when I was young, I mean, that kind of palpability of the injustice of how property order society is, is evident in, in this area, which is also where I grew up. Um, when I went to school and got educated, I learned sort of an, an, an antithesis to that, which is the idea that property is made just by its efficiency. So this is a picture of a supply and demand uh, graph. Uh, that is a picture of Alfred Marshall, who was the sort of uh, creator of that idea. Um, he, Alfred Marshall, was uh, was working in the late 19th, early 20th century, which was a period of time in which lots of kind of lots of ideas were being sort of scientified and mathematized, and you know, brought into this sort of reductive framework. Uh, the uh, but it's important to see, I think, the, uh, the power of the story before we move beyond it, which is essentially that uh, property rights, secure property rights enable exchange between people, which creates a surplus that makes everyone better off. Um, now, the, um, it, we can go to the next slide. But the important thing to see, I think, is that as soon, basically as soon as that story began to be told, it was uh, under attack by all kinds of intelligent people who saw it as a reduction, right? Uh, so we have, we, there was uh, Henry George who, who uh, um, uh, put forward the very you know, important idea that, for example, the value of land is not created by the owners of the land, but by the people around the land, by the communities around it. We had people like Thorstein Veblen, uh, who's an economist who coined the term conspicuous consumption and kind of cast really interesting doubts on the idea that the exchanges that property facilitates are really creating the kind of welfare that we, you might imagine. Uh, you had uh, thinkers from the progressive era like, uh, like Robert Hale, uh, who were pointing out the ways in which the whole sort of order of property was based on, was you know, rested on this foundation of coercion. Um, and that kind of, um, you know, that and, you know, ideas from the labor movement and many other ideas kind of coalesced into sort of a new deal uh, um, way of thinking about economics in this country, uh, which was, I think, you know, was not perfect by any means. It was, you know, kind of, but it, I think that it fits and starts the conversation, at least in this country, was moving towards a, uh, an attempt to sort of um, reconcile the contradictions of property with a, with a democratic society. But something kind of interesting happened, which, which is that it, in, around the middle of the century, basically, the way that we think about property sort of got consumed into this geopolitical struggle. So, uh, you know, the, the, our ideologies around property became um, um, geopolitical. Um, and the interesting thing about this sort of, uh, uh, you know, neoclassical supply and demand thing is that whatever its contradictions, which people were, were well aware of, it, uh, it had great ideological virtues, which is that, you know, in, in the context of that time. So the United States was sort of trying to define itself in opposition to these other ideologies of fascism and communism, and whatever the problems with that sort of uh, um, Alfred Marshall view of economics were, it provided a way of organizing society that ideologically was clearly distinct from either fascism or communism. And that kind of, I think it sort of collapsed the conversation into a sort of a, a post-war state ideology type of a thing that has been with us uh, for a long time. But that kind of, that sort of post-war ordering uh, seems to be dissolving a little bit. And uh, I think it's useful to sort of go, you know, pick up the conversation where we left it off. Um, so, 
the property is efficient in a sense, but it's important to see that it is efficient really only for investors. So if you sort of think of money going into property and money coming out of property, right, and money coming out of you know property interests, property rights are sort of a are, are a very powerful guarantor of sort of closing that loop, making sure that the money out rewards the money that went in. But it quite exquisitely ignores everything else. It ignores the um, the networks of, of human beings and culture that um, that go into property on the sort of front end, and then it ignores famously the externalities, uh, the consequences of the of the property arrangements on the on the back end. Now the or we can go back to that slide for a second. So the um, um, the idea, you know, roughly is that is that the state is supposed to worry about all these other things, but it's important to reflect on basically the difficulty of that task. It's incredibly, uh, uh, it's a lot to ask of, of, of even a state to try to understand the enormous complexity of these, uh, of all these inputs and outputs that, um, uh, that aren't just captured by, uh, by money. And in a way, it kind of replicates the sort of information problem of trying to plan an economy, arguably figuring out, you know, all these things that property rights are ignoring is just as complicated or more complicated than trying to like plan an economy centrally. Um, the other uh, thing to notice is that the guarantor of those kinds of things, the state is this very same entity that is uh, quite committed to guaranteeing property rights. So we sort of have a fox in the hen house to begin with. Um, all right. So but what exactly is a miss with property rights? What, one way of thinking about it is that property rights are too transferable. So the sort of transferability of property rights, their ability to go to the highest bidder, leads to, it pulls communities apart. It pulls power out of communities. It, may, it leads to social fragmentation and anomy. Another possible problem with property rights is that they're too permanent. So the fact that they that the fact that they just sort of last forever and give their holder permanent power leads to problems like compounding power, power concentration, monopoly, and social stratification. And these two problems can sometimes seem to be in tension, which is quite sort of, I think, confounding in many ways. But another way of thinking about it that I find really helpful is that. Uh, the problem with property is that it's too transferable and permanent. It's really like the marriage of these characteristics that makes property, um, or that makes the sort of property regime that we've inherited uh, what it is. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this is a, a major sort of tip of the cap to uh, Katerina Pistor here, who we'll hear from in a moment. Uh, her work really helped me see this uh, more clearly. Law transforms things into capital by creating property rights that are maximally transferable and permanent. There's something really important here. Um, so a lot of my work and a lot of radical exchanges work um, is about using the tools of legal and financial engineering to basically decapitalize assets. So if you can think about a uh, conventional property interest, there's sort of a way in which you can, it's a, like a bundle of sticks, a bundle of rights comprises of property interests. And there's a way that you can sort of pull those bundles of rights apart into, into two pieces. One which is permanent but not transferable, and another piece which is transferable but not permanent. So you're kind of trying to avoid overlap between these characteristics of transferability and permanence. Um, the idea of a permanent but not transferable right Roughly, is it, it? It's that's the kind of it, that's that is basically the majority of the power contained in a property right, and that can be held by a community on moral or, or political grounds. The idea is that the community can evolve, but that it isn't you know, the, but the, the power that it holds isn't something on a market. On the other hand, transferable but not permanent rights, which is you know something that might be a little bit of an opaque phrase, and I, I can explain much more about the sort of uh, ideas that that, that that go into that. Um, over the course of the weekend if we get a chance to talk. Um, but the idea of transferable but not permanent rights is that they're things that, uh, that can be bought and sold by stewards but can't be held forever. So this, this is sort of a character, uh, sort of a uh, design pattern that frustrates power concentration and monopoly. Um, so this general sort of um, um, template 
characterizes a lot of a lot of work that I've tried to do, and I think also a lot of work that a number of other brilliant people in this room are doing, um, including the idea of partial common ownership. Uh, also, the ideas about data cooperatives and trust and how, trusts and you know sort of how to how to reform the way that we hold power over data and uh, what kinds of things we might do to improve uh, intellectual property law. So I think that the, these kinds of ideas have you know, many applications. They, we can think about, um, we can sort of use this way into the problem to think about how to do property and land better, but we can also think about it in the context of data, corporations, art, as we'll hear more about soon, um, intellectual property, labor and contract, and, and much more. Uh, so these are a few examples of, of projects that, um, uh, that, that I've been involved in. Uh, one is the Beyond Cultures of Ownership collaboration with Serpentine, which is looking at ownership in, in the world of, of art and culture. Um, with the, uh, in the upper right, this is a collaboration with the artist uh, Tomas Saraceno, which, uh, which uses some of these ideas. Uh, we're also working with uh, with an entrepreneur in in Maine who uh, who is interested in who is basically building a mixed use real estate development uh, that will uh, um, attempt to instantiate some of these ideas. Um, so that's it. Um, I, th those are some ideas that I wanted to uh, to just put into the room. There's obviously a lot more to say, and uh, fortunately we've got um, we've got a lot of time together, which I hope we'll we'll use well to to dive into some of this stuff um, together. Thanks.